John 11, and we come now to just a, a passage that I just, I, I'm excited to go through here today, and we're going to be covering chapter 11 in, in two parts, and in chapter 11, what we're going to be seeing here today is, is it's great because we're, we're hitting now again this last of the seven signs of Jesus, the the gospel of John, John is writing through his gospel and recording not only seven I am statements, which we'll see one today, but also seven signs or miracles of Jesus that are there to really demonstrate the power of God, to demonstrate that Jesus is the son of God, that he is the promised one. And so today as we get to the last and the seventh sign of Jesus in the gospel of John, it's, it's probably the most important and powerful one because it's raising Lazarus from the dead. You know, there were three um, friends that were out driving together, a doctor, a teacher, and a lawyer. And as they're out driving, an SUV came and cut them off. And they got in a terrible accident and they all died. And as they were waiting to get into heaven, they began to talk and, and say, what do you hope people say about you at your funeral? And the doctor said, well, I, I hope people will just say what a, a caring and compassionate doctor I was, you know, really good bedside manner. The teacher said, I hope, you know, people will say what a, a great educator he was, investing in people and really was a good mentor. And they looked at the lawyer and said, what do you hope people say about you at your funeral? And the lawyer said, look, he's moving. That's what I hope people say about him when he... <laughs> the first service got that so much better. Did I say it wrong? And, and that's what we're going to be seeing with Lazarus here, this man that everybody looked as dead and yet is going to be brought back to life. And it's, and it's, like I said, an important, it's an important sign that John gives because it's really showing and demonstrating the power over the greatest enemy of humanity, and that is death. It's probably the thing that people fear the most is dying. And yet it's a rally for all of us, but Jesus shows something so wonderful that he is even more powerful and mighty and is the conqueror over death. And so we see that here. Here's what we're going to be looking at as we go through these first 27 verses in chapter 11 this morning. We're going to see the purpose of Jesus, verses 1 to 6. We'll see the priority of Jesus and then the promise of Jesus. The, the purpose, the priority, and the promise of Jesus. So let's look at this first one, the purpose of Jesus. Verse 1 of John 11, it says this. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So here we are, we're introduced now to this family that was very close to Jesus and whom Jesus was also very close to. They had this great relationship and connection. We've seen them before in the Gospels in Luke chapter 10. Uh, Luke chapter 10. Heaven. It's a new number I'm creating here. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10. All right. Luke chapter 10, it, it tells us the story of, of Mary and Martha. And it's a familiar story if you are a student of the Bible, because here we see, again, the, the difference kind of of these characteristics of these two sisters, uh, of Martha and Mary, because it's there that Jesus comes to the home, and we see this difference that oftentimes gets played out even in the lives of Christians, because there we see Mary was sitting with Jesus at the feet of Jesus. Mary is sitting, Martha is serving. Mary is devoted while Martha is distracted. Mary is worshiping while Martha is worrying. Mary is basking in the glory of Jesus while Martha is busy baking in the kitchen. You see, there's these two kind of differences going on where we can oftentimes be those that are, are distracted and, and full of worry. And yet Jesus says, listen, Martha, don't worry about those things. Mary has chosen the better of these because, you know, you'll always have those things there, but you're not always going to have me with you. And so Mary is choosing to say, I want to take time and just be with Jesus. It's always a good thing. In fact, that's what, what Jesus called his disciples to do, just to come and be with him. And so Mary is choosing just to sit at the feet of Jesus. And, and, and here we see John referencing another scene with Mary and Martha. Because there are many Marys in the Bible, right? You, you see all these different Marys coming to you. And you're like, who? Which one is that one again? Well, John wants to really be clear about who he's talking about. And so he identifies Mary as the one in verse 2 here that anointed the feet of Jesus with that fragrant oil. 
wiping her, his feet with her hair. Now that's recorded for us in John 12. We'll get to that in a, a couple weeks or a couple months, we'll see. But John 12, we'll get there eventually and we see that account. Now it hasn't happened yet in our timeline and chronology, but John is, as he's writing this, remembering that. And it's interesting because remember when Mary <clears throat> anointed the feet of Jesus and there were some of the disciples, Judas especially, criticizing her for doing so, saying, why would you give up just this great, uh, this commodity that could have been used for so many other things, but Judas was just concerned because he was the keeper of the money bag. And she gets criticized and Jesus again says, listen, the poor you'll always have with you, but me you won't always have with you. And Jesus says, wherever the gospel is preached, what Mary has done will be spoken of as well. And here's John now kind of fulfilling that in a sense where he's, he's sharing this account and he's saying, listen, Mary, that one that anointed the feet of Jesus. What a great thing it is to just be with Jesus, to sit at the feet of Jesus, to pour out our lives to Jesus, because that begins to be just a sweet witness. Just as Mary breaking that and I'm getting into our message that we'll be covering in John 12, but just as Mary broke that oil and just that fragrance filled the house, so too, when we begin to just live a devoted life to Jesus, just the fragrance of that begins to impact others. We begin to be a great witness of the Lord, and, and so too, Mary is being that great witness and being identified as that here in John's gospel. Now, Bethany is mentioned here as the, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha, that's how it gets identified for us. Because again, these are special people to Jesus. Bethany was about two miles outside of Jerusalem to the east here. Now, it's about 17 miles from where Jesus is right now. Because you remember Jesus left that area of Jerusalem at the end of chapter 10. And he moves outside. And so he's about 17 miles now outside of uh, of Bethany and, and Jerusalem. It's a bit of a long trek now. And plus there's big elevation changes. So it's quite a commitment to go there. And we'll see that kind of referred to as we move along in our text here. But what's interesting is Bethany. The name Bethany means, um, it means house of dates. Also it means house of misery. House of dates and house of misery. Now that's odd because these seem very contradictory to one another, don't they? House of dates is something, you know, when you eat dates, when you go to Israel, you're going to eat dates or you're going to have a date mixture and it's sweet. It's good. House of misery doesn't remind you of anything sweet. It's very sorrowful. And that's what we're going to see pictured as we go through John 11 here because there's going to be an event that goes down with the death of Lazarus where it's going to bring great misery to this family. There's going to be great sorrow going on. But what are they going to do? They're going to call out to Jesus. See, when we bring Jesus into our situations, he can turn that which was sorrowful into that which now becomes sweet. Jesus has a way when we allow him in to do his work where he turns things from sorrow and misery into sweetness. And that's exactly what we're going to see here in John 11, which I think is just so neat that the very name Bethany really pictures and models that for us here. I'm reading on here in verse 3, it says, Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Notice what the sisters do here. They simply made the need known. Jesus, the one whom you love, he's sick. They don't tell Jesus what they want him to do. They don't command Jesus. They just want to commune with Jesus. They just want Jesus there. And they just make the need known. And they approach Jesus on the basis of his love. Do you see that? The one whom you love is sick. So often, I think we tend to gravitate to this idea that we need to approach Jesus off of our, you know, good works, our merit, you know, Jesus, I need you to do this. And well, I've been pretty good. I've been pretty faithful. I've been going to church. I've been reading my Bible. Look at how, so Jesus, can you please help me here or minister in that way? Look at what I've done. I've been so faithful. And we come to Jesus oftentimes on our own merit or we think that we deserve this instead of coming just simply based on his grace and his love for us. Here's the thing. We, we never deserve what we get right? That's what grace does. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve any of the goodness of God. It, it's all because of his love for us. And what a wonderful thing it is to be able to approach Jesus based on his love for us, to understand 
how much he loves us. And they use an interesting word here. For love, they say the common word in, in the New Testament for love is that word agapeo. Agape, which means that unconditional love. But they say the one whom you love, phileo. Not, not filet of fish. I know it's getting close to lunchtime. Don't start drifting on me now, okay? We're not talking filet of fish. The word phileo, which means this brotherly love. It's, a, it's an affectionate term. It's a term used when there's just that friendship and relationship that you just enjoy with one another. It's that affection. It's like saying, Jesus, the one whom you like. Isn't that neat? You know, I, I, my, my wife oftentimes will say to me, you know what? I, I don't just love you. I like you. And I like that. Because here's the thing. We're commanded to love one another, right? We're all told as believers how we need to love one another. That's the command. And so oftentimes we can say that, I love you. But deep down you're just going, I have to love you. <laughs> but liking somebody is a whole nother matter. We can say, I love you because that's the Christian thing to do. But are we able to say, I like you? Well, here's, here's what... The sisters are saying, Jesus, the one whom you phileo, whom you like. Jesus cared for them. And they understood that. And they knew that. And I'm so glad that Jesus not only loves us, but he likes us. He wants to be with you. He wants to spend time with you. He desires that we call out to him, that we meet with him, that when we have a need, we go to him. Why? Because Jesus just loves to be with us. Sometimes I think that's why Jesus allows things into our lives, simply so that we will turn to him more because Jesus loves, likes to be with you. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you glad for that? He doesn't love you because he's like, well, I'm God and I have to love you. So no, he likes you. And these sisters understood that relationship with them. How radical is that. Well, verse four, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the son of God may be glorified through it. Now to say that the sickness is not unto death seems a little bit odd. You might think, Jesus, hold on a second. Slow down a little bit. Don't you realize Lazarus is going to die? Now, if you've read ahead, or if you know the story, you know Lazarus does die. So how can Jesus say that this sickness is not unto death? That seems to be Jesus again going against what's really going to happen. But here's the thing. Jesus knows what the final outcome is going to be. That the sickness is not going to result in permanent death. That Jesus is going to come and reverse that. He's going to again bring that sweetness out of the sorrow that they're going to go through. And he's going to revive this life here. And that's what we need to understand here today, that nothing happens in our lives. It, nothing that happens in our lives is without the purpose or opportunity for God to do a work through it. Whatever we encounter in life, that becomes an opportunity for God to do a work through it, just as he's going to do with Lazarus. Oh, this sickness is not unto death. Oh, he'll die, but you wait and see what I'm going to do. See, Jesus has a purpose in what he's doing right now. Nothing happens apart from God permitting it for his purposes. Do you, do you recognize that in your own life? That whatever you go through in life, God is allowing that to accomplish his purposes. So oftentimes we think, oh, I'm going through this because, oh, I must have messed up or the enemy must really be targeting me. But do you realize that the enemy can't do anything unless God allows him to do it. Now, God's not the author of, of evil and God's not the one doing that himself, but he will allow things to happen so that he can even carry out his purposes in a greater way. Even if that's allowing Satan to do what he wants to do. Look at the story of Job. That's a great illustration and example of that for us. So everything we go through becomes now an opportunity. And what does Jesus say? It's an opportunity for the glory of God. And not just the glory of God, but that the Son of God may be glorified through it. It says it right there in verse 4. Our lives exist for the glory of God. Do you guys recognize that today? Your life exists for the glory of God. Whether it's an, an angry boss, a loveless marriage, a terminal illness, a dysfunctional family, everything that we encounter is an opportunity for us to live in a way for God to be glorified. Everything that you go through becomes an opportunity for God to be glorified in it. Do we live our lives with that kind of perspective? 
Are we looking to carry out that very purpose of God? How do I glorify God? You see, Christian maturity is learning to look at a situation and knowing that whatever you face, you face it so God can be glorified through you. D does that make it feel like your life is insignificant? Maybe you're just a pawn in God's cosmic chess game? Now, on the contrary, this passage shows that the glory of God and the love of God are not at odds. See, Jesus stayed for two reasons. First of all, for the glory of God. And we're going to see that he's going to stay longer where he's at, even though he gets word. We'll see the next verse. But he stays, and he's going to stay for two reasons. For the glory of God and out of his love for, his fam for this family. For the glory of God and for the love of this family. God's glory and his love for you are not enemies. We need to reject the temptation to pit these two against each other. God's glory is displayed chiefly in his bottomless love for his people. And so whatever you're encountering, we don't have to look at it and go, God, don't you love me? Why are you allowing this to happen? Sometimes it's out of his love for you that he's allowing this to happen because he knows what the final outcome is gonna be. He knows the greater good that he's gonna accomplish. He knows the purposes that he's gonna, he's gonna accomplish in it. And it's ultimately gonna be for the glory of God. Are we living our lives with that purpose? That was something that Old Testament saints had to come to know and, and even experience themselves. Look at Joseph, for example. Joseph had to realize that even though he was... He was rejected by his brothers, sold as a slave. He was falsely accused. He was thrown into prison. He was forgotten in prison. All these things happened. And yet at the end of his life, what does he recognize? Look at Genesis 50 verse 20. But as for you, he's speaking to his brothers. As for you, man, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, Joseph didn't understand all that as he was going through it. But in faith, he says, God, I'm gonna trust you. And he came to a point where he was able to realize God, you did all of that ultimately for a good purpose, and that was to save many people. You don't see it at the time oftentimes, but we have to, by faith, realize, Lord, just be glorified in this. Let me live for your glory. Romans 8.28 reminds us that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. So, verse 5 Reading on here in John 11, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now that certainly doesn't seem to be the action of someone who loves these people. Oh, Lazarus is sick. Okay, listen, I got a few more things I want to take care of, a few more restaurants I want to try out here, a few more touring places I need to stop at, but soon I will get myself over there and see if I can help. That doesn't sound like... I'm going to stay two more days here now in this place? That doesn't sound like the action of someone that loves these people. But again, Jesus knew the better plan and purpose in mind than just healing Lazarus from his sickness. He was going to accomplish something so much more, so much better. And that can be so hard because we don't always know the purposes of God. And we think we know best and, and, and when things should really get done. And you see, when things don't get done according to our time frame or according to our schedule, what happens? We begin to panic. We begin to think, God, where are you? Don't you love me? Don't you see what needs to happen? And we can begin to try to push and make things happen. But God wants us to learn the beauty of trusting him and resting in him by faith, knowing that he's working it all out for good. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Because God's timing is not often our timing. In fact, I'd say it's rarely our timing. We want instant action, instant satisfaction. We want things to be done now. And this idea of waiting, but here's Jesus now delaying. But understand he's delaying to bring about a better work. Sometimes God's delays are simply to bring about a better day. His delays often are just meant to bring about a better day for you, for others, to accomplish his work, to display his glory. Are we trusting him in those things? So here's the purpose of Jesus. It's to, to glorify the Father. It's what our purpose becomes, to live in a way where we are glorifying God. But now we look at the priority of Jesus. Look at verse seven. 
Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. And are you going there again? So obviously this didn't seem like a good idea to the disciples. Where we picked up or where we left off at the end of chapter 10 last week, what were the Jews doing? The religious leaders there in Jerusalem picking up stones to stone Jesus. They wanted to kill him, right? And so now he's making his way back to this area and the disciples are thinking, Jesus, don't you remember what we just encountered over there? And you show yourself again? I mean, they are waiting. They haven't calmed down. They haven't, you know, their rage is still, still burning. They probably got their rocks in their hands still just looking for you. I mean, why would you want to go back there? It didn't seem like a good idea. And so that's why Jesus, he moved outside of, of the religious leaders' area of influence and out of their control. He moves outside of that area. And now to go back to that area would just be setting himself up for trouble. Well, look at what Jesus answered here in verse 9. Jesus answered, he said, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, of course, the disciples are hearing that and responding as they normally do. Huh? What? Like, that seems like an odd response. Like, you're thinking, what are we talking about here, Jesus? We just said it's not smart to go there. And you start talking about 12 hours in the day and light and night. What is going on here? Odd response that left the disciples scratched in their head, as often was the case, I'm sure, with many of the things that Jesus said. They didn't get it. They didn't understand. But what Jesus is speaking here about is that as long as a person's walking in the day, well, there's enough light to see what he's doing and to keep him from potential harm. Now, in a spiritual sense, Jesus is saying that he's still walking in the light of day and mostly in the daylight of his ministry, right? Right? The whole gospel of John is recording all these times about it was not yet time. It was not yet time. In other words, there was a very clearly appointed time when Jesus would come and yield his life for the very purpose that he came to this world, and that was to die on a cross. But everything was being guided along by this divine timetable and by the safety and security of God that it was not yet time, so nothing would befall Jesus apart from God's control. So Jesus says, I'm still walking in the daylight. In other words, there's still work for me to do. That was the priority of Jesus. I'm still carrying out the work of God and nothing is gonna happen to me apart from God's you know, will of that happening. So there was nothing to worry or fear about. Man couldn't override God's purposes and plans in Jesus' life. He's still walking in the daylight of his ministry, and nothing would befall him until his mission on earth was complete. It's a similar picture to what he said in John 9, verse 4 to 5, where he says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. So he knows, it's daylight. I must carry out the work of the Father. Night is coming when I'm not going to work, but right now it's daylight. So Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem, and nothing can happen to me apart from God allowing that to happen. There was safety in that. And understand, that's how it should be for us. When we recognize when we're serving the Lord, when we're living for the Lord, nothing is going to happen to you apart from God allowing it to happen. So often we live in just fear or worry of like, should I do this? Should I go there? I better not go there. I got to protect myself. And we fail to realize, wait, I'm in the Lord's hands. And like George Whitefield said, I think it's so good. We are immortal until our work on earth is done. God's got a time appointed for each and every one of you. And nothing's going to affect that. No man can override God's purposes and plans in your life. Do you know that? Do you realize that? How wonderful that is. So we can live with just a, a freedom to say, man, I want to serve. And of course, I mean, you don't be stupid in that, right? You, you have common sense. You don't go, you know, skydiving without a parachute and think, oh, well, no, it's, you know, I think I'm still in the daylight of my life. I, nothing's going to, no. God's going to be saying, yeah, today is the appointed day when you're going to die. You're jumping without a parachute. That's what I, you know. So obviously you'd be, you'd be wise. You'd be, you'd be good stewards even of your life and, and of your ministry. But you serve the Lord with just a freedom to say, God, I'm in your hands. 
And I don't have to fear what man can do. I just need to serve you and be faithful to what you've called me to do. And so Jesus said there, he's walking in the daylight. But he also says um, in verse 10, but if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. So I think that's a good reference to these religious leaders, often referred to as the Jews in, in the Gospel of John, who were a bunch of, you know, stumbling, bumbling buffoons trying to carry out their work, but never been able to. They're picking up stones to stone Jesus, and then all of a sudden Jesus would just kind of escape from them. They're like, where'd he go? Where is he? I mean, they couldn't do what they wanted to do because they're in the dark. They had no desire to walk in the light or even come to the light. And so Jesus had no reason to fear them or to have his work hindered because of them. Reading on in verse 11, these things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him, that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. So as Jesus prepares to go to Bethany, and as he's preparing his disciples to go along as well, they greatly misunderstand what's really going on. They think Jesus is going to come and just, Lazarus is sleeping. He's been sick. He's resting. So Jesus is going to come and wake him up. They're thinking, oh, Jesus, hold on. Let him sleep. He's been sick. He needs to get his energy. He needs to recuperate. Let him sleep. Don't wake him up. They think that's all Jesus is speaking about. It's like when you're sick. What do you want to do? You want to rest. Like if I got a cold, I'm going to try to stay in bed for a good day or two, five, six days. Tops, you know, but I'm going to want to rest, right? I want to stay out. Let me see. Let me, let me get over this here, right? And that's all they're thinking. But you see, Jesus is not talking about that. He has to be a bit more clear. In fact, he says in verse 14, then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, all right? He's got to just kind of, oh, you guys, you're not getting it, all right? I'm not talking about sleeping physically. I'm talking about him. He's being dead. He's dead. He's, a, he's, not, he's not waking up on his own. He is dead, all right? And you've got to break it to the disciples here now very clearly, very concretely. But you see, what's neat about this is for Jesus, raising Lazarus up from the dead is no different than you or I just coming in the morning to wake up one of our kids. In fact, if your kids are anything like mine, I think Jesus might have the easier of the two jobs, raising Lazarus from the dead. You ever try to wake up one of your kids sometimes? You're like, are you dead? Move, show me a sign at least, wave something. Let me know you're still breathing here, right? You ever try to wake them up? They're not moving at all. But for Jesus, he's like, this is nothing. This is just like waking a person up from sleep for me. I'm gonna wake him up. I'm gonna... Bring him up from the dead. This is nothing for Jesus. Verse 15 says, And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Now that almost sounds a little bit sadistic here that Jesus is glad. He's like saying, I'm glad that I wasn't there. I'm glad that Lazarus died. And you think, you listen to that and you go, well, hold on, Jesus. Nobody, nobody's glad about death. In fact, that word glad is mostly translated in the New Testament as rejoice. If you see somebody rejoicing over the death of another, you're going to look at them and go, what are you, are you insane? Are you, what's the matter with you? You don't rejoice over somebody, somebody's death. But Jesus says, I'm glad that I wasn't there. I'm glad that last, why was he glad? Again, because Jesus knows what the outcome of this is going to be. He knows that Lazarus is going to be raised up from the dead and that this is going to cause many people to see and to know clearly the very power of God and the very person that Jesus is, that he is indeed the son of God. It's an opportunity for their faith to grow. See, that's what the Lord allows in our lives sometimes, to allow difficulty in our lives at times so that we can see and give opportunity for the power of God to be on display as we look to him, as we seek him in those things. So this is the reason for Jesus to be glad because this is gonna build faith now in his disciples and in others and, and help them to believe. And we see next how they need it. Look at verse 16. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Yay, Thomas, right? Great encourager, Thomas. Let us go. We're gonna die with him too. Now, this is the first time that Thomas is, is, you know, referred to, mentioned in the Gospel of John. 
And oftentimes when we think of Thomas, we think of Thomas as he had, uh, referred to, identified for us as what, somebody? Doubting. Doubting Thomas. You all know it. Doubting Thomas because Thomas wanted to, even after hearing that Jesus rose again, he's like, unless I see and touch, you know, those nail print hands, uh, I won't believe. Thomas is doubting. He wanted, to, he wanted to have proof. And then we see this account here. But I think Thomas sometimes gets a bit of a bad rap because I don't think Thomas is doubting or, or just a discourager here. I think what we see with Thomas is great loyalty and willingness to say, Jesus, I'm willing to go all the way with you. See, if I were Thomas, I'd be like, hey, Jesus, here's an idea. Why don't we try this? Why don't you go to Jerusalem? We'll hang back and just kind of, you know, cover home base here right now. There's still, I think, a few more people we need to share about you with. And so why don't we stay here? We'll hang out, minister to these people, and you go to Jerusalem, all right? And then maybe we'll meet up later. Chances are we probably won't, but we'll, you know, try to meet up later. How's that for a plan, Jesus? That would be me. I don't know if I'd be willing to say, let's go. And if it means we're going to die with Jesus, then so be it. But that's Thomas. That's the kind of guy I want on my side. I want to be a guy like Thomas says, Jesus, wherever you have me go, I'm willing to go, even if it means death. Because isn't that essentially what we've all been called to do? To live our lives in a way where we are surrendering ourselves to Jesus? Didn't Jesus say in Luke 9, 23, that if you desire to follow me, anyone desires to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What does that mean to take up your cross? It means that picture of death. It means that you're laying your life down and you do it daily. You're not living for yourself, but you're living for Jesus. You're living for the glory of God. And I believe that it's only when we live that surrendered life, when we've laid our life down, that we're ultimately gonna bring glory to God. Because so often, and this is the battle daily, that's why I think Jesus says daily to do it, because the battle daily is to pick up our life, and to live for ourself. We're very, we're very selfishly driven by nature. And it's a daily battle to say, no, I'm gonna crucify the flesh. I'm gonna lay myself down. I'm gonna deny myself that I might live for God, that I might live for the glory of God. And you see, when we're living for the glory of God, guess what's gonna happen? Your joy meter just goes up. We think it's oftentimes in reverse unless I'm living for myself, unless I'm serving myself, it's only when I live for myself that I'm gonna be happy and joyful. But have you ever tried doing that? Have you ever tried living? I think, I think selfish people are the most miserable people. Why? Because when you're living selfishly, when you're living to serve yourself, well, what, you want everything to go your way. And guess what? Not everything goes your way. Not everybody is out to serve you or bless you, or cater to you. And so when we're living for ourselves, we quickly become irritated when people start bumping up against us, when people start doing things that are not our way. And we get bothered, we get frustrated. Your joy meter just goes Brrr. But when we've died to ourself, as Jesus calls us to do, when we're willing to say, Jesus, I'm living for you, I'm going all the way with you, even to the point of death, I'm, I'm surrounding my life, we're fulfilling what we've been created to do, and that is to bring glory to God. And when we're doing what we've been created to do, guess what? Joy meter just goes up. Nothing bothers us as much anymore because it's not about us. It's about Jesus, you see. Have you ever gone up to a, a dead person and poked them, hit them? Guess what? No reaction. Nothing. Nothing phases them. Why? They're dead. I mean, don't try that. That's a terrible illustration. Don't do that, but not, there's no reaction because they're dead. When you died yourself, suddenly you're going to see that there's no longer things that are, are hitting you, bothering you, provoking you, angering you, frustrating you. It's not about you. So, you know, I died to myself. It's not about me. It's about living for the glory of God. And that's going to be the most joyful, exciting life to live. And Thomas, I think, is right there. Oh, he's gathering. He's rallying the troops. Hey, everybody, let's go. Let's go with them that we may die with him if that's what it takes. But we're gonna go. We're gonna lay our life down. So we've seen this 
purpose of Jesus, the, the priority of Jesus now in, in walking the light, serving the Lord, carrying out the will of God, even for ourselves now, carrying out the will of God, laying our lives down. But now, lastly, we look at this promise of Jesus. And this is great. Look at verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the woman around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Verse 21. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So check this out. By the time that Jesus arrives in Bethany, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Now let's kind of go back in time here a little bit because Mary Martha sent word to Jesus, the one whom you love, our brother Lazarus, he's sick. So they send word. That, that's going to take about a day from where they are to get to where Jesus was, about a day. And then what does Jesus do? He stays two days. And now he goes to Bethany the fourth day. So in other words, by the time word got to Jesus, Lazarus was already dead. He's been dead. Jesus would have known that. But he still decides to stay two days in Bethany and then come back on that fourth day, on that, on that journey back to Bethany. Four days Lazarus has been dead. Now, why is that important? Why is that significant? Well, it's significant because this would mean that Lazarus was really dead, right? This would be very clear. There, there'd be no argument here. He's been wrapped up in grave clothes. He's been placed in a tomb, sealed up. It's desert country. I mean, nobody is gonna, even if he was wrapped up while alive, he's not gonna be able to survive being in the tomb for four days. I mean, this guy clearly was dead. There's no mistaking this here now. So it's significant because now this would, legitimize this miracle as truly being the power of God over death. Plus, what happened now is it allowed for a group of mourners to come and gather on. There were even Jews, those that were opposed to Jesus that were coming and mourning and grieving with the family here. They've come from Jerusalem. So now even those that were opposed to Jesus would be witnesses of the very power on display in raising one from the dead demonstration to many witnesses. Now Martha comes to Jesus and notice this here, she's kind of full of disappointment. She's, she's bummed out, as I think any of us would be. She says to Jesus in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, if you had just been able to do this, then it would have been all better. It would have been fine. Have you ever responded that way to Jesus? Lord, if you had just done this, then everything would be much better. Have you ever responded to Jesus that way? Like we seem to know better than the Lord what would have been appro the, the appropriate thing to do, right? We like to kind of counsel the Lord and say, Jesus, if you had just, did you not get it? Did you not understand what was at stake? If you had just done this, and we think we know, Above God, what's the appropriate thing to do? I have a hard enough time just doing the appropriate thing with my kids as a parent, right? I used to tell them, you know, when the ice cream truck comes by, if it's playing music, it means it's out of ice cream. You know, <laughs> save me a fortune, just maybe not the most appropriate thing to do. And so we can struggle over those things. We can, we can think we know the right thing to do. But oftentimes... We don't understand the, the big picture, what, what God wants to do here. We never know what God has in store through these things that we're going through. Perhaps his will is to bring about a greater work even through our, our pain or tragedy. See, we always have to look at the big picture, never discount what God is able to do. Martha seems to be getting there in part because she, she responds in verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Whatever you ask of God, God will give you. You see, Martha saw that relationship that Jesus had with the Father, and she believed Jesus would be able to do a work in this, although I'm sure 
The idea of raising her brother Lazarus from the dead was not high on that list of possibilities. I think she's thinking, Jesus, however you want to work this out, okay, we'll trust you, but my brother's dead, and if you'd been here, that would have all been taken care of. And we can think that way oftentimes. Lord, if you had just responded this way, if you'd just done that, instead of saying, Lord, whatever you want to do to maximize the glory of God in this situation, let it be done. Well, Jesus said to her, verse 23, he says, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, Jesus already knows what the outcome of this is going to be before he even does it. He hasn't raised Lazarus from the dead, but he's like, your brother's going to live again. Don't worry about it. And you see what Martha does is she begins to think, yeah, I know. And she's holding this common belief that Jews had that there would be a general resurrection in the outcome of the last days. That at at the end, kind of, God will resurrect all the saints and that they'll be with him. So she's looking ahead to a future day, to, to a, a one-time event where, yeah, I know he'll be resurrected then, but what good is that for me now? Yes, I get what's going to happen, but what about now? Now, It's oftentimes what we do with Jesus ourselves. We think, okay, God, I, I get what you have in store. I get what you're going to do. Yeah, there's hope in those things, but what about today? What about now? Lord, how are you taking care of my need right now? But notice how Jesus responds to her because it's full of care and kindness and, and packed with this promise now. Look at verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Here Jesus now gives again the fifth of these seven I am statements that John is recording. These I am statements to show that Jesus is Fully God, that term I am, the same term that God used to Moses in the burning bush to identify who he was. I am, the all existing one. Everything that you need, I am. And we see these I am statements throughout John. We've seen four of them already. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. Here, he identifies himself as the resurrection and the life. And what Jesus is showing Martha is that her hope shouldn't be in an event in a resurrection, her hope should be in a person. It's in Jesus, you see, because he's not just responsible for a resurrection. He is the resurrection. He is life. He is everything that you need for your situation today. It's not found in in an event. It's not found in a substance. It's not found in an action. It's found in a person. Jesus wants to be all of that for you today. And so when you're sitting here saying, Jesus, Oh, I know what you're going to do, but what about now? What about today? Jesus wants you to know, I am. I am what you need for right now, for today. I am the one that's going to come and give you life because I am life. I'm the one that meets that need. What you truly need can only be found in Jesus Christ. He's the one that gives all that you need, which leads to satisfying life. And he takes it one step further than just dealing with Lazarus or Martha because he gives a promise that all those that believe in him will never die, but they will live. Is there a promise that can ever be greater than that? To realize all those that believe in him will never die, but they will live. Just think about that. As believers in Jesus, you never have to worry about death. Because if you're in him, then you have life because he is life. Again, one of the greatest fears people have is death. And for believers in Jesus, fear is taken away. I never have to worry about death because Jesus is the life. Is that not good? Are you awake, everybody? Is everybody with me? Is that not good news? Now, let me just make sure we're still tracking here with reality because let me just give you the other side. 
you're still going to die physically, right? Jesus isn't saying, oh no, you will escape death, period. You're still going to die physically. Jesus isn't saying that won't happen. In fact, you're dying a slow death right now, not just through sitting through this message, but you're, you're in a sense decomposing even right now. You're slowly decomposing. Your body right now is dying a slow death. That's why we have deodorant, cologne, perfume, because we want to mask that. We know like our bodies, they're not getting better. They're, they're decomposing. It kind of reminds me of the story of a man that went for a walk in, in the woods and he came upon a cave and he looked in the cave and he sees this light flickering there and he walked in a little bit further to see this and he sees a man sitting by the light and he's rubbing these notes off of this sheet music and he looks a little bit closer and he recognizes the person. He says, are you Mozart? And the man looks and he says, yes. And he, the man says, hold on, like Wolfgang Mozart? And the man said, yeah. And the, the hiker says, wait a second. You've been dead for centuries. What are you doing rubbing notes off of that music? Mozart replied, I'm decomposing. So it's something that we're all going to experience. Slowly we're having that happen. Bring it on. That's okay. I can take it, people. Okay. Thank you for that clap over there. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. So, no, it's good. That's, that's, no, it's just mercy right there. That's just charity. It's a charity clap. That's okay. I'll take it anyways. But listen, we're going we're gonna to experience death physically, but understand that now in Jesus, that death physically just moves us on to eternal life, to better life. It's life with Jesus. It's life face to face with Jesus. It's what our, our hope is in. Our death physically just graduates us to greater life now, eternal life. And one day we're going to be reunited with our resurrected body, a body that's fit and made for eternity. Jesus, when he had his resurrected body, guess what he did? He ate with the disciples. We're going to be enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to be eating. We're going to be, we're going to be functioning in our bodies but they're glorified bodies. You're not gonna need treadmills for these bodies. You're not gonna need diets, amen. amen. It's glorified body. It's, it's, it's life that I'm excited about. But this is what Jesus has promised us, you see. It's consistent with what we see in scripture where, where when we leave this body, we're just with the Lord. Paul, Paul would say in 2 Corinthians Five verse eight, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Philippians 1.23 says, I'm, I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. But he sees, like, I, I still got a work to do with, with all of you there at the church in Philippi. He's saying, I'm hard pressed. I wanna, I wanna leave this body so that I can be with the Lord, but I know there's a work to do. You keep pulling me back in. I'm, I'm hard pressed. I know the importance of that, but man, I can't wait to be with Jesus. Paul lived his life that way. Like Thomas, like, I'm ready to die because I don't have to fear death because I know what that's gonna lead to, eternal life. Because Jesus says, I am the resurrection of life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he's going to live. There's better life awaiting us. And just as Jesus asked Martha, it's a question we all have to answer. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Is this where your hope lies today? Are you confident that if you were to die, if you were to die today, you would move on into eternal life with Jesus? And Jesus gives us the requirement here. What's the requirement? He who believes in me. And again, that's not a belief of just recognizing that there is a God or believing that, oh, okay, I, I guess I can reason that Jesus came and walked this earth. It's not just believing that Jesus was. It, and when John speaks those words, believing in him, it's saying that you're putting your trust in Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, to do that work that you can't do for yourself. It's saying, Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner and I need to be forgiven of my sin. I can't earn that forgiveness. I can't achieve that on my own. I gotta put my trust in you. I need you to do that work for me. Jesus, I'm relying on you to save me, to be my Lord and Savior. That's what it means to believe in him. And Jesus says, if you believe in me, man, you don't have to fear death. You don't have to worry about death. You'll never die. You're going to live. 
because he is the resurrection and the life. Do you believe that today? Are you assured of that? Do you have confidence in that? If you're sitting here today and you're thinking, if I were to leave here today and die, where would I spend eternity? If you're sitting here in doubt over that, that can change in a heartbeat. Because all it takes is you saying, I need to surrender my life to Jesus and I need to take his life as my own. Jesus died on a cross to take the penalty for your sin and to exchange it for his righteousness. He took all of your sin to give you his righteousness. And all it takes is you putting your trust in him and calling out to him to save you. And if you do that, the Bible says that you're born again. You're born again. You become a, a new creation, a child of God. That you can have that hope of eternal life. If you're here today and you're in doubt, all I ask you to do is call out to Jesus. Change that doubt into an assurance. It's not by what you do. It's not by how you live. It's by the fact of, are you in Jesus? And is Jesus in you? Is he your Lord and Savior? Have you taken him in and applied his righteousness to your life? Do that today. And there's that assurance. There's that now understanding that, yeah, I'm in Christ. I have his life now. The resurrection and the life. Well, this ends in verse 27 with Martha doing just that. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Now, she says some very powerful things here. She says, I believe you're the Christ. In other words, you're the Messiah. You're the, the promised one, the one that we've been looking for, waiting for. And not only the Messiah, but the Son of God, that you are fully God. I believe who you are and that you're the one who's to come into the world to supply that salvation for us. Martha put her faith in Jesus. It was no longer in a doctrine or an event, but it's in a person. In Jesus Christ, the only one who can save and bring everlasting life. May you have that assurance today. May we keep looking to Jesus. We've seen here, I'm gonna invite the worship team to come up and we're gonna just close and just uh, worship and just respond to the Lord. But we've seen here this purpose of Jesus to bring glory to God. Are we living our lives to the glory of God? Do we, have we surrendered ourselves to say, yeah, Lord, my highest goal is simply to, to bring glory to you in every situation that comes in, whether it's a difficult, hard trial, whatever I might go through, Lord, just be glorified in and through me. And we see that, that priority of Jesus in, in serving the Lord, carrying out the will of God, knowing that he's walking in the light and nothing can befall him. Are we continuing on not living in fear or worry, but just saying, I, I'm just walking and abiding in Jesus? serving him and making that my priority. And then we see the wonderful promise of Jesus here, the fact that he has given us life. Are you living in that life? Are, are you enjoying that life? Are you allowing that to be seen in and through? I pray that those are the things that we're taking to heart here today and, and living out and being thankful for what we have in Jesus. Let's stand together and let's just... Um, close with a, a couple songs of worship. And this is just an opportunity for us just to, again, ask the Lord to just work this word into our heart. And I'm gonna invite the prayer teams to come and make themselves available in the front or in the back. And if, we're, if you're here and we can pray for you, we'd love to do so. Maybe it's a prayer for a need you have. We wanna come alongside and support in prayer. Maybe it's some of these things that you just need the Lord to continue working. You just want someone to help you and just guide you in prayer through that. And so we'd love to do that. So make your way to the front and just go and see one of the people up here just to pray with you and for you as we just end with um, worship and response to the Lord here today. <laughs>